Nick Hornby joins me live in Studio Q. Hello and welcome. Hi. What drew you to the 1960s? It's kind of your first real historical period piece in a novel, isn't it? In a novel, although um, an education um, actually ended in 1963 and this book begins in 1964, so I'm sure that had something to do with it. Also, um, I knew when I started the book that I wanted to write about uh, these characters old now at, at at the end as a coda in the book so partly it was a question of maths i thought if they're old now they were at their peak 50 years ago and that takes me back to the 60s age is an important theme thread throughout this book and i do want to address it but let's start when everyone was young and uh, sprightly <laughs> how old were you in the 60s and are, are you nostalgic for that era uh, I don't think I'm, uh, even I am not old enough uh, to have enjoyed the 60s. Uh, I was born in 1957, so it was uh, something that I, I could observe at second hand, really. There are many illustrations in this book, photographs, and among them, well, they're real people, uh, as if you wanted to share your research with us. There are cameos in the story itself by Keith Ralph of the Yardbirds and Jimmy Page from, uh, well, I guess he wasn't in Led Zeppelin yet, and, of course, uh, Lucille Ball. Why was it important to you to to uh, funnel these um, uh, cameos into the book? Well, I wanted the sitcom to feel as real as possible, and... Um, and, and it's success to feel real. And if the success feels real, then it's going to take it and the characters into a, an orbit of real people. So Harold Wilson, the British Prime Minister, who was very media savvy, would certainly have uh, noticed Sophie, the lead character, and thought, I can look good if I stand next to her. Well, just as he did the Beatles at election time. Absolutely. He gave them medals, yes. <laughs> uh, a, f- a funny girl is set really around the same time as Mad Men, the TV series, I suppose. Yes, it's true. Uh, Mad Men started way well, before, I guess, didn't it? It started but, before, yeah. but it goes right into the early 70s, yes, doesn't yeah. it? So, so the, the book tracks many of the same concerns that we uh, enjoyed in the, in, the mov- in the movie, in the TV series, shifting attitudes towards women, sex and sexuality, vulgarity, and so on. What were you hoping to convey in terms of sort of key differences? What would you say the key differences are from the UK perspective? Well, I think one of the extraordinary things about the UK is that we were completely made bankrupt by the war. Um, so um, between 1945 and 1960, uh, we were a penniless country. Actually, America was made by the war, and, and the, the 50s were a fantastic time economically. There was food rationing in the UK until, I think, two years before I was born. So even though you got to the end of the war and everyone breathed a huge huge sigh of relief, they still couldn't get the things they needed until the end of the 50s. So um, the 60s was a casting off of something um, very, very recent. And um, the 60s was the first decade where, for example, we all had televisions and a a hit show in the 60s really meant something. So I think there were crucial differences between the UK and the US. The funny girl in the title of your book is Sophie, or at least that's her screen name that she adopts. And she's a very talented young woman from northern England who dreams of being a TV a comedian. I, I have to say, I was reading this book uh, on the airplane coming from England to here, and one has a scotch or two, you know, while reading. And I wrote in scribbly uh, uh, words that I could hardly read afterwards, this is the most exciting female character I've found in a book in years. Oh, wow. Well, good. <laughs> she, the way she breaks through is so exciting. And in what way is that emblematic of that time? Because there weren't that many female comics on TV, were there? No, um, I think one of the interesting things about England is that we didn't we didn't have female comedians, that, that America did have Lucille Ball, and this created a sort of wave after wave of, of female comics here with uh, Goldie Horn and Mary Tyler Moore and so on and on and on. Um, and, and in the UK, the uh, programs like Steptoe and Son, which became Sanford and Son, and um, the Likely Lads and even Monty Python. You know, in Monty Python, of course, the, the guys played women. And <laughs> every now and again, there was an attractive young woman in a bikini who ran across the set. Uh, but it was it was a boys' club. And um, there is a bit of alternative reality about creating this comedian and putting her there. So really, there wasn't one? There really wasn't one, no. She, the, I put her in the gap where she should have been. Uh the, uh, you've written a number of books uh, recently and uh, fe- featuring female 
protagonists uh, who chafe against society's expectations. And you were quoted recently as saying that you felt that often journeys of young women are more moving. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of Wild as well, you know. Yeah. Uh, but why did you say that? Uh, well, I think a lot of male characters, the reasons that they're not allowed to do the things that they want to do is because of what's going on in their own heads. I mean, let's face it, if you are male, there isn't an awful lot stopping you. Whereas <laughs> um, young women, especially young women um, in previous times, had all kinds of obstacles placed in their way. And to overcome those obstacles shows um, of necessity, courage and heart and intelligence and drive. And, and they're pretty interesting qualities to write about. Sophie wins the lead role in a TV comedy despite her inexperience, about a couple that falls in love, and they're from completely different social and, and regional backgrounds. Uh, the show writers say they want it to be about the class system, men and women and the relationships between them, snobbery, education, the North, the South, politics, the way that a new country seemed to be emerging from the dismal old one they'd all grown up in. Sounds like kitchen sink drama, i.e. Alan Silito, John Brain, etc., but with lots of laughs. With jokes in, yes. Um, I mean, two of the models for Tony and Bill, the, the comedy writers Galton and Simpson, um, they, they'd started a bit earlier, but they they had a bit of Pinter going on, I think. They, 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 some of their scripts are very Pinter-esque, and, uh, and yet they did it within the confines of a mainstream either radio or, or, or TV format. And, and I think it was a time in, in Britain where you could do that, where you could take risks with mainstream TV. Do you think a TV program can drive social change or does it merely reflect it? I think back then it could drive it. Um, one of the extraordinary things um, I, uh, I realized when I was researching this book is that... Um, Steptoe and Son, which became Sanford and Son, one episode of that had a audience figures of 29 million um, and a country of 50 million. Uh, literally, the whole country stopped to watch these programs. We had two and television Can you channels. describe what Steptoe and Son was about? Well, it, it, was, was it was a rag and bone. It was rag and bone men in Shepherd's Bush, um, a, a, a young guy and his dad and uh, they were they were extremely poor it was pretty dark actually well because the dad was also such a, an inveterate racist wasn't he he was old values and so he, he was old values cantankerous and, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes and toothless and uh, absolutely um and and the son even though he was in impoverished circumstance had ambition and, and felt as though he was missing out on on life uh but i think that to reflect Britain back on itself um, in that way, where, where you had such enormous viewing figures. I think it had to have driven social change a little bit. The show is called Barbara and in brackets and Jim, emphasizing the female sort of uh, pr projection of the program, yes. uh, becomes known for addressing subjects quite frankly uh, like sex and divorce. And you have some marvelous scenes where some extremely censorious and intellectual critics weigh in, uh, saying that the program is a step down the slippery slope towards complete vulgarity. Uh, how do you, where do you stand on that? Have, have we slipped down into complete, <laughs> into a bath of vulgarity? Well, uh, I, of course, don't like this critic, particularly Vernon Whitfield. I think he's uh, I think he's wrong on uh, every single argument, except weirdly, um, I think he's remarkably prescient. And um, I guess he's talking about celebrity big brother. And um, here we are. He says in the book, he says, it's only a matter of time before people are going to take up on TV. Yeah. Uh, in an interview with The Guardian, you recently said you, you didn't want this stodgy guy to be right but you couldn't help but think that we've sort of ended up watching people sitting on the toilet. Well, we, we I think, more or less literally do watch people <laughs> sitting on the toilet now. Um, I, I still think that in the end, uh, popular taste has something to say. And we're always distracted temporarily by these things, but in the end we reject them and we, we, we end up valuing things that are of merit. So oh, I've not given up all hope. That's interesting, because uh, in the book you seem to make a more spirited argument for the other side, for freedom, you know, for, for the pleasure in life and, uh, and, and frankness and so on. Well, I guess there's a trade-off, isn't there? Yes. I, 
where I where I park companies, where I think people are being cynical, where I think that very clever people are not using their full intelligence because they think that they can exploit the gullible and the weak-minded. What I love about uh, the people in Funny Girl and this period generally is that it was very smart people writing as hard as they could at the top of their game for a popular audience in a way that wasn't going to exclude anyone. And there's something incredibly thrilling about that, I think. We mentioned early, earlier on uh, the notion of age, the theme mm. of age in this book. You really capture the feeling of youthful optimism in the 1960s, but there are more than a few hints that uh, a culture that focuses on youth will leave casualties. Can you talk about there's the magician, the sad magician whose role now is on the end of some sad carnival pier. And then uh, well, tell, tell us a little bit about the age thing, because Lucille Ball as well. Yes. Um, well, of course, uh, all popular culture is, tends to be quite youth focused and um and these characters are in their mid-20s and they're having the time of their lives and there are as you say casualties all around them it's not just the youth and age there's also a sense that uh, the the swinging 60s um of england didn't actually accommodate everybody and uh, i think that some i can't remember who it was a photographer once said the swinging sixes were 200 people and i knew all of them <laughs> um and i think that's probably right that it uh, it didn't really affect the rest of the country and this poor ma magician he's he's old school he's not that old but it's old values and um i think one of the the telling parts of the book is where sophie bumps into keith ralph of the yardbirds in a nightclub and even though she's young keith ralph thinks they're all incredibly square and doesn't want much to do with them because that's that's show business and it's a different set of values and what about the scene with Lucille Ball on the, the steps of it's near Buckingham Palace, isn't it? Well, it, it is. Um, Lucille Ball was in London in, in 1966, and she did make a show called Lucy in London, which had terrible, catastrophic reviews. And um, you know, she wasn't she wasn't young herself by then. Partly the point of that scene was that Sophie's desperate to meet Lucy, and when she does meet Lucy, Lucy blanks her because she doesn't know who she is. And um, there is that sense of never meet your heroes. And, <laughs> and it's not because your heroes are going to be horrible to you or they're horrible people. It's just that they don't know what to say to you. There's also a, an elderly couple who we understand were once celebrated actors but nobody recognizes them when they turn up for an audition to play <laughs> old people. <laughs> yes. And not even the makers of the program, not even Sophie. And a great ha question mark hangs over. Were they based on real people? Who were you thinking of? No, they were not based on real people. But, um, of course, one of the extraordinary things, when you get older, you start to work out where time is in relation to the time when you were young. <laughs> and, um, you know, 40 years ago was the 80s. And uh, we. It was? Yeah. <laughs> 70s, 70s, <laughs> 80s. And, uh, uh, and the 70s seemed really, really close to me. And uh, the agent, um, Clive's agent in the book, um, he's been working since the 1920s. And you forget that the older people coming up to retirement in the 60s had been around since just after the First World War. It's quite extraordinary how history telescopes together like that. The end of the book is so, for me, very poignant. Uh, the program has had a kind of a brief revival. Somebody tries to revive it as a little theater thing uh, on the coast. But it, it, uh, it's finished for TV. But when someone approaches Sophie, and now she's, what, in her 60s, 70s? 70s, 70s yeah. uh, And wants to do some kind of nostalgic revival, she, her answer is, all I want to do is work. And you see uh, actresses, uh, who is it in Downton Abbey who plays, sorry, it just, just slipped my mind, the elderly. Is elderly. it Maggie Smith? Yeah, Maggie, Maggie Smith. You, you, she has said also, nobody gives me any roles anymore. It's not just young women who complain, but there are so many marvelous roles for elderly women, surely. And uh, uh, in, as you were writing that rather el elegiac ending, uh, did you have any hope for Sophie? Was she going to get any more work <laughs> ever? Um, my hope for Sophie is simply that she's humble about her, her life. And um, it's not important to her that she's famous. It's important to her that she's getting work. Some of the other characters in the book, like the old couple that you mentioned, like Clive, his thing is that 
they are, they are sliding down towards ob obscurity and oblivion. And Sophie just wants to be on a stage or in a TV studio or doing anything that allows her access to her own creativity. Um, and and I, I find that a rather kind of beautiful attitude. It's what I hope uh, when the time comes that I'm able to accept that as long as someone's letting me write, then I don't care what it is or how many copies I'm selling. There's also one half of the writing couple uh, is gay, and he yeah. comes out, and he comes out quite uh, spectacularly with a celebrated book or two, but he never really follows up. So he's another example of, we see him later on in terrible decline, really. Yeah. Uh, was he, were you thinking of any, not Joe Orton, I suppose, because he got murdered, uh, cut down in yeah. his prime, but was there anybody else that you were thinking of, did you? Well, I know it sounds weird, but Tony and Bill, the two writers in the book, I was actually thinking of Lennon and McCartney. Oh. <laughs> Uh, because um, Tony is a sort of traditionalist. Once he's the one who can write, as it were, three minute great three minute pop songs, mm -hmm. and, and wants to keep doing that. Whereas Bill is the one who wants to push uh, and 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 experiment and knock down walls. And yeah, he writes the the, the gay novel, and 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 they can't hold uh, as a, as a partnership simply because of it's nothing to do with their sexuality; it's their attitudes. And um, and I. After I'd started, I realized that it was becoming Lennon and McCartney, or the myth of Lennon and McCartney, anyway. And the gay writer just about does say, how do you sleep? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because he's so disgusted by his partner's marriage. But, of course, Tony uh, uh, digs him out of a hole in the end and, and clearly has done repeatedly uh, in the intervening years. There's a, uh, I find, a kindness and a gentleness. Uh, uh, you have a very forgiving attitude towards human beings in your novel. Novels, uh, is what I mean. The agent that you just referred to is somebody we expect to be one more god-awful predatory male who only wants to take Sophie because of her, 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 her titanic uh, bust, you know. But he turns out to be someone who's very self-consciously decent, and he constantly says... I'm a very happily married man, you know. <laughs> and well, that's it, yeah. you're the, as I say, a kind of writer who you, you seem to shy away from the horrible, horrible people. Is it, are you like that or why? why? I mean, I, I remember in High Fidelity, everybody's, I'm sure there's some rivalries and, you know, some, but people are so good to each other in your books. <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it's not a criticism. It's a hope that I have um, for people and, uh, uh, I think when you're writing, I find that if I can find the good in the least promising character, then my job becomes more enjoyable. And the, the agent that you talked about, well, of course, the cliche is the predatory male. So in order to find something that's fresher than that, then you, you twist it on its head. You think this is a man who surrounds himself with young girls and repeats as a mantra over and over again, I'm a happily married man, just to keep him out of trouble. And he does stay out of trouble. Well, I, I find that at least it's different and it, it cheers me up and I hope it cheers other people up. I think it's the, the role of some writers and artists to offer people consolation. I don't know, I, I'm becoming soft in my old age, but uh, I find I become terrified uh, by moments in books where it looks like someone's going to crash and burn. Uh, like in the, in the movie The Wrestler, I don't know if you've seen with yes. Tatum Channing, where he's doing so well until he's offered cocaine. And I sat there with my knees in my mouth just thinking, oh, don't, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> And of course he does, it he does it and goes off the rails. And there are great moments of tension in your book. I'm not saying your book is without tension in that regard, but people do tend in the end to uh, uh, revert to, well, um, sensibility, sense, sense, good sense, common sense. More or less, yes. And, and the ones that don't are looked after by the ones that yeah. have it. Yeah. Um, so I, I did really want to write a book that was real and optimistic at the same time. Often period pieces help us understand our own era through similarities and differences. What do you think we have to learn today about today from the 1960s of Funny Girl? Well, I think one of the interesting things about culture now is how uh, fragmented it is. You talked about Mad Men and, uh, and covering a similar era. I read recently that the first episode of the last series of Mad Men in the UK, the, the viewing figures were 60,000. Um, when it was broadcast at the time. And of course, we watch on catch up and we watch illegally and we watch on, on, on DVD. And we have 
fantastic choice. There is never any reason to be bored anymore. Whereas I can remember my childhood, I was bored all the time. It's one <laughs> of the reasons that I read so much, in fact. And um, I don't want my kids to be as bored as I was, which probably means I don't want them to read as much as I did. Um, but I think that uh, the the lack of, of, of a cohesive culture um, is maybe more of a problem for us than we've yet realized. Well, when people watch the TV program in your book, they watch as a family. Yes. And that's an experience we sel more seldom have today. And I think it explains why the makers of the program in your book felt a, a, a social responsibility. Didn't yes. They? Um, the, the BBC generally had extraordinary social responsibility. Um, I read, uh, there's a marvellous series of books by a social historian called David Kiniston, and he was talking about how in the 1950s, the BBC... Uh, at six o'clock in the evening, just suspended all broadcasting because it was the time that you put children to bed. <laughs> it was called The Toddler's Truce and there was nothing on television for an hour and there were no other channels, so that was it. What a good idea. <laughs> Nick Hornby, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful novel, Funny Girl. And Nick Hornby has been with us live here in Studio Q.